And then I gotta hit play on this, right? Yeah, hit record on the audio. We are live. Are they live? Oh, clap or no? Yeah. This monitor is the one that's a pain. Yes, of course. I just tell me. I know Thais, just tell me when to go. We're recording on. Okay, I got both. We're good to go. Okay. You ready? Uh, oh, wait. Let me double check. Audio is still good. Red light, absolutely certain it's going. Yeah, red light, 21 seconds. Is it counting up oh. or down? Or? Yeah, okay. Cool. Good. Okay. I'm Indy Nidell, and this is another Great War Weapon Special. Uh, now, we've done a whole bunch of these on different weapon, different rifles and different handguns used by several of the different warring nations, all in collaboration with Othias from his awesome channel, C and Arsenal, and Othias is here with us today. Othias, can you please say hi to everybody out there? Howdy, everybody. Nice to see you again, Indy. Yeah, it was really, I, I, you know, I, I miss, we haven't done one of these in a while. I kind of missed them because, uh, well, I learn a lot, and I just think it's, you know, fun to pick your brain about the different guns. Um, yeah, me, makes, sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to say a couple of words about live stream before we jump into things, okay? Uh, since this is a live stream, uh, every now and then we have to take pauses for things like uh, Othias cooling down his cameras, and then we'll be editing this into several actual you know, 10, 15, 20-minute specials. But the live stream is, of course, longer and more exciting and more interesting. Um, now, Othias, what are we going to talk about today? All right, so for the live stream today, we have U.S. weapons, and then you guys asked me if we could do some work with machine guns, and we just so happen to have enough in shop to be able to talk about those, too. So I believe we'll start with uh, the U.S. side of things, because we haven't covered that yet, Right. and then we can just get on into whatever. Okay, well, uh, do you want to jump in with American uh, rifles or American small arms, or where do you feel like going? Uh, I say let's go small to big, so let's do the handguns first. All right, okay, well, let's get started. What do you got? All right, so today uh, we're going to talk about some handguns from the U.S., and I'm going to start with probably the standard issue that most people are familiar with and probably doesn't need a lot of exposition. That's going to be the good old U.S. Model 1911. This is a Colt product in 45 ACP. Now, uh, let me go ahead and get you a closer look at that gun. There we go. There we go. And so now this is a big gun. For a big hand, I'm much, I'm much larger than the average soldier back then, so this is a bit of a hold on. Uh, the reason the U.S. went with this is because they were worried about stopping power, which is something that's almost sort of joked about nowadays because most people have moved over to 9mm Parabellum. But realistically, it is a large bore, heavy hitting 45 ACP cartridge, single stack, seven rounds in the mag. If you really were trying, you could get one in the chamber and then keep her cocked and locked with that safety over on this side. Now, uh, this gun was mostly not popular with the Europeans due to the very heavy recoil, but the US seemed to like it just fine. Bring it back down. Uh, overall, it's a very good shooter in a lot of ways. They have a very linear trigger. They have a very comfortable grip. And th by the way, you can look at it. It's a modern handgun. Uh, there's guns today that still use the same locking system, although simplified. Um, the cartridge has remained popular in some circles, although, like I said, people have moved more towards 9mm Parabellum these days because it has the right output for the right recoil and follow-up. But there's fans of the 1911 right now, lots of them. And so if you stop and think about some of the other handguns we've seen and doing this series with you guys and then over at our show, there's not a lot of guns that stack up this well compared to modern firearms. Yes, there are improved guns out now, but it took pretty much until the 60s and 70s to get away from uh, this particular design in any significant way. So this was very much ahead of the curve for its day. Now, when did this enter enter service? Uh, well, 1911. So it's just off the model number. Uh, it was developed because of a gun that I have here, actually. Um, here, let's just go ahead and get to the next gun while I'm talking about it. So I'll put this 1911 aside. And then this is actually going to be probably one of the lesser common guns. You're not going to see a lot of them in U.S. service, although they do turn up in photos. This is the old Colt New Army. So this was a 38 caliber single and double action revolver with a swing out cylinder. Let me get you a closer look at that. All right, so this would have been common for like Spanish-American War period, swing out cylinder, simultaneous eject, rapid reloading. Although it did have some mechanical problems that leads to it basically walking out of what's called time. And what that is is here, let me make sure that she's absolutely empty. So when we index the cylinder by either pulling back the hammer or by pulling that trigger all the way through for double action, the way the cylinder rotates over, 
Well, that's done by what's called a hand or a pawl in here. And yeah. it presses up on the back of that cylinder and it's going to stay in alignment with the bore or else you start to shave metal or worse detonate, you know, and actually clip the inside of the barrel and cause, you know, shattered cylinder or something like that. Well, the thing about timing is when you have a swing out cylinder, this also becomes a factor in timing the gun because if this part gets loose, well, you're going to be walking off that bore. And these guns were not designed well because essentially the rotation of the cylinder, you can see it's rotating to the left. Well, it's pushing against this gate trying to open. So over time, the more you use this gun, the more likely it is to walk out. But was that in that was that what was in regular service before 1911 or how how you said it was quite yes. rare? But how okay, this so that was for before 1911. Before that, we had you know single action army. We were still doing 45 caliber. U.S. liked a heavy broad, like a big wide bullet, lots of weight, lots of knockdown, which made a lot of sense when you had a single action gun because you don't have rapid follow up shots. You want each one to count. But then when they came out with this, well, they thought we can get a much handier gun, and I assure you, it is a very handy feeling revolver. Uh, and they go with a lighter cartridge because we can pump out more rounds and reload much faster. So why not? Well, when occupying the Philippines after the Spanish-American War, they were having trouble with uh, sort of determined attackers with spears. And while they were able to successfully kill them with this gun, they were not stopping them quickly enough to avoid getting poked themselves. Oh, wow. And so there would be a temporary period where they tried going back over to a Colt single and double action in 45. Uh, that was short-lived. The Marines would go for what's the Colt 1909 um, and sort of a 45 long Colt cartridge. But ultimately, when we went for the next handgun, we went with that automatic 1911 pistol chambered in 45 ACP, which was a nice... Now, at the time, that was fairly hot, but nowadays we think of it as a very slow round with a heavy hit. Um, and so it was very popular for sort of a one-shot, one-kill mindset. Right. Um, and it sounds good until really you get into a modern shooting understanding in which follow-up shots count a lot more than just sort of precisely aiming one good round. Um, and so fierce recoil, but honestly still not as bad as you'd think because it has a very well-designed grip, very good ergonomics. And this gun would stick around for the U.S. all the way through World War II with very minor modifications. Um, now, this did not keep up production. So it's not just the 1911 handgun and a handful, mostly, by the way, still in naval service with these new armies. These were not common on the battlefield. Um, what they ended up doing instead is the U.S. wanted a common cartridge for everything. They wanted 45 ACP in their handgun and in their revolvers, in their pistol and revolvers. So the problem with that is 45 ACP is what's known as a rimless cartridge, and most revolvers would use a rimmed cartridge so that they could be contained in the cylinder and extracted properly. And it's just a much easier setup because once you have a rimless cartridge, it's going to try to fall through the cylinder unless you do something to retain it. Well, uh, Colt and Smith and Wesson rose to that challenge uh, with the models 1917. So these are two very similar looking large caliber revolvers, but realistically they are different in design internally and with their releases and things like that. But they were both called the model 1917, one provided by Colt, one provided by Smith and Wesson, and they both used a half moon clip. I have some dummy rounds here, so let me get you in closer on that. Yeah, cool. There you go. So right. you'd have two halves of the moon for your six shots. Right. And then what you would do is with your Colt or your Smith and Wesson, you would take your half moon, load one half, load the other half. So you have rapid loading. And it also now retains a rimless cartridge inside the revolver. So you get two benefits out of this. You get to keep a rimless cartridge in a revolver so that you can share with your 1911 ammo and you get rapid loading. And this works for both guns uh, who both have, again, slightly different actions, but generally the same principle. They're both very large single and double action guns. Now those are snap caps. They are fake ammunition. They can't do anything. Again, single action. We've talked about this before. I pull back the hammer and then I very gently touch the trigger and it's already ready to go. That's very good for accurate, slow fire. Or if you're in a hurry, you just pull that trigger all the way through. However, at that point, your finger is overcoming all the spring tension in there right. all together through the pull so that can throw off your shots. But both of these guys would have been available. I believe it's like 150,000 of each were made during that war. Um, and they would stick around. Both actually stuck around through World War II all over again. So if there's so there's like three hundred thousand of them total, and a bunch more of the earlies. Uh, so this would this account for the majority of the small arms that the Americans had in 1917, 1918, or was there 
a bunch of other stuff that I'm just predominantly you are going to see in most war photography the 1911. The U.S. did a pretty good job of producing these guys. Uh, plenty were cranked out. It's just that again, a war of attrition. You've got to crank out everything you can get. So why let an assembly line sort of sit there stalled? Both of these big revolvers. So the 1911 gets you know contracted for by the government. They start producing it. Um, Colt Springfield, those guys are looking at it, and they try to ramp up for the war, and they do to a certain degree, but the cost of setting up an entirely new factory versus taking an existing commercial assembly line and adapting it, well, that's a big benefit because both of these guns were in commercial production, albeit not with this particular barrel or this exact grip or something, but both of these were being marketed as big bore revolvers, and actually versions of both of these would be sold to, say, Canada and Britain in 455. Uh -huh. So they were already available in a large caliber, a large cylinder bore, uh, all it took was adding that special technology of the half moon clip. And then later nowadays, you can still get full moon clips are more popular, where it's the whole six in one go. Um, it's just that its standard issue then was the half moon so that it would lay flatter on your hip instead of having that big wad of cartridges that sort of stuck out whenever you put them on your belt. Okay, cool. No, that's interesting. Um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm talking to myself. I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, no, you're all right. Um, oh, is there, do we have any more pistols that we're going to look at today? No, those are our pistols. So if you had any questions about those, we still got some film time on this one. Um, now, in terms of, uh, of the, were they made in, I mean, let's say uh, the 1911, was it just in like a single factory that was responsible for all of it? Or were there several factories all over the U.S.? Because we saw like with some of the French guns, you know, it had things coming from Spain and stuff, for example. So right? The U.S. production could get pretty weird because when we look at, uh, this is a very odd thing to start talking about with U.S. arms during the war because the U.S. was a big arms provider commercially for a lot of countries. We've seen their weapons turning up all over in the Great War. But the interesting thing is that U.S. had a special relationship, a generous relationship with Colts. And so generally you tend to think of productions of machine guns and particularly the 1911 coming out of Colt, although Springfield would also try to produce as much as possible in addition. However, you start to get into some interesting things when you try to produce these guns outside of Colt commercially, because then Colt gets very defensive of not wanting to have another producer touch on what they're making. As a matter of fact, there would be in the machine gun world, we're going to do an episode on this later, or no, we already did. We did a uh, Browning automatic rifle episode. Colt was very protective of sort of producing the BAR, even though they were doing a terrible job of it. And so finally the government had to force them to give away the ability to produce that gun because they're so far behind on their contracts. So, uh, the 1911 could have been produced in greater numbers if it had been expanded to more manufacturers, but generally, no, you're looking at like Springfield and Colt as the big producers of this gun. Okay. See, that's interesting how it works out the different production techniques that we've seen from when we talk from country to country and stuff. It really was. Right. Wait, Flo is waving at me. What are you waving at? Okay. Uh, Flo says, can I ask, how good were they? I mean, these three say compared with some of the some of the handguns we've seen from the European nations and stuff. Well, a lot of the times, oh sorry, well, a lot of the times when we talk about uh, firearms in either World War One or World War Two, especially being in the U.S., you get a lot of sort of American exceptionalist ideals. Like people are always like the U.S. had the best this or the best that. And I try to sort of not over favor U.S. weapons in our own series because there's a lot of stories out there for other guns that had plenty of inventiveness to them. But I will say. The U.S. market probably had the best handgun market. Um, we've worked with a number of military revolvers, a number of military pistols, and I'm going to tell you that the 1911 and World War One is among my first choices. Um, mostly because at this time, a lot of you are probably going, well, you know, I'd rather have a 9mm double stack or whatever, but those options just aren't really out there. You have 9mm Parabellum showing up in things like the C96 and the Luger, but they offer their own challenges. Whereas this gun right here, yes, it's a heavier cartridge that most people did not favor outside of the U.S. and actually, weirdly, Norway. Um, <laughs> they, yeah, Norway adopted the gun as well as the Model 14 with a slight improvement to the slide release. Um, but realistically, like most countries are not into this sort of big, you know, hard recoiling, uh, heavy hitting weapon. They just went ahead and had their pistol serve usually just as a symbol of office until the war kicked off. And then you see a lot of European countries scrambling around with 32 ACPs in a battlefield. And the U.S. is like, no, nah, we'll just go for like the U.S. had a stronger pistol culture. Like it, a handgun was sort of second nature to a lot of countries to the U.S. because I guess with the, the Western expansion and everything like that, we really had gotten used to the idea of having an all around good handgun. And so that's why you see so much care in the adoption of this one versus other countries just going, yeah, this kind of works. This will be fine. It's not like we're betting a war over it. Um, and then in terms of the revolvers, 
it's hard to beat either Colt or Smith and Wesson Revolver from that period because both are fit so well and timed so well. And then also both of these guns came about, you know, in the short decades after all the problems with the first swing out cylinders falling out of time from Colt. So Colt has changed their rotational direction. Um, as a matter of fact, here, let me zoom in on this. Like we saw before with the other one, when I pulled that hammer back, it would rotate over to the left, pushing yeah. against the crane. In this case, they've changed it. They've shifted it to torque into itself so that it doesn't walk out of time over years of use. And then the Smith & Wesson has the same rotation to the left that should be a problem, but they added a reinforcer up here. So right at the uh, front of our sort of ejector push rod, so again, open, you would simultaneously eject like that, but also that spring pressure pushes a dimple forward that rests on a little notch here that's spring powered. So that keeps all that from putting too much lateral pressure on the crane and therefore walking out of time. Wow. wow. Clever. Clever. Put me back to me. What do you say, Flo? Should we like to cool down now? Oh, he's, he said, did you need to cool down or, or no? Uh, what's my time at, Bruno? Uh, we're sitting right at six. Let's just wrap out pistols and then I'll go to cool down. OK. okay. Um, uh, yeah, tell you if there's anything you want to say to close this off, and then we can do a couple of end cards and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, so ultimately, US only has three considerations for a handgun. Uh, they went very strongly with the 1911. This has its own mythos. You guys don't need me to tell you a lot about this. There's tons of stuff on the internet on these. The 1917s did three things really well. They allowed you to use existing assembly lines. They allowed you to use that 45 rimless ammo that's yeah. standard in a revolver with that half moon clip. And then three, like we kind of talked about, they allowed Colt to not necessarily have to go crazy and start trying to file for lawsuits or back royalties or something for somebody else producing the 1911. These guns, the designs of which were both already owned by their respective companies, although this is a Colt gun, so Colt would have Colt's permission. But um, it's just one of those things where it's like, we have an existing line, we don't have to get into an entanglement over rights, we can just produce this gun and have it share the ammo. And you'll see these, if you notice, you pay close attention to the pictures, a lot of times you will see a 1917 sort of butt sticking out of a holster for a lot of US servicemen, even up to the front line. So these were good, reliable revolvers. And then at the rear line, you would have the last, uh, Grandpa's technology, uh, the new army, which at this point we're getting fairly long in the tooth and we're probably not used in active service, more so with Navy and guards and things like that. Okay. Now, do you have you done any episodes on your channel about any of these specific weapons? Currently, the only ones that we've covered are the new armies. Uh, the 1911 episode is on the way. There's some contract pieces in different uh, chamberings that I would like to talk about because the guns were also given over to Britain and sold over to Russia. Uh, and I'd really like to be able to talk about those. So we've been holding out towards the end of the series to get that done in proper fashion. And then these 1917 should be coming up pretty soon. They have two very distinct evolutions. So we're going to break into two distinct episodes um, because there's brave, basically for both of these, there's precursor models that serve with other countries. So it's fine to talk about them totally independently because they're often confused for being the same gun because they have the same model year and the same caliber. But they work quite differently and they both came from different places. Uh huh. Now, um, if I do an end card for this, where, what one of your episodes would you like me to link to? Since you haven't uh, done those. Yeah, cards? I would say the Colt, the Colt New Army. Okay. Well, uh, Flo, should I do an end card like that now? Okay, everybody. Well, uh, thank you, Athias, once again. And that was great for today. Uh, now, if you'd like to see his episode about the Colt New Army, uh, you, you can click right here for that. And if you have not subscribed to his channel, you should go over there and do it right now because you get to see people firing the guns and you learn all kinds of things about the guns. Uh, Othias, say goodbye to everybody out there. Yeah, and thank you guys for tuning in. And like Indy said, if you're curious about any of this, come check us out. There's a lot of story to these old small arms that goes beyond just sort of point and shoot. It talks a lot about industrial history, opinions about how the war should have been done, and then opinions about how it was actually going during the war when they changed their minds. Well, that's what I think is most fascinating. That's why I think uh, it, your channel is really fun and is a great compliment to like what we do that we don't have time to talk about. Uh, okay, well, uh, I'll say for the third time, thank you very much. And everybody, don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter, and all of your dreams will come true unless they involve shooting people with guns, in which case they probably won't. See you next time. That was a good one, right, Phil? Yep. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to kill and cool for about three minutes. What did you say? You, oh, that's I'm going to... I'm killing the cameras and letting them cool for just a couple minutes. Okay. Um, am I still on or no? Was that still recording when you stopped it? You guys are still live. Okay.
Okay, I'm just gonna move that fan and, and, and refill my coffee. So, hang on. No, that can run because they can run forever. So no, I, I was thinking if I could lean it uh, lean it here, if it would still be on camera. Let's see if that makes a difference at all. No, it doesn't because it's too far. It's too uh, okay. Oh, there's. Make sure. That I just thought if I leaned it like this, it might. Yeah, just. I think the play button's the top. It would top need to one. be on top speed. Yeah. Okay. So Let's two to nineteen minutes. Is that too noisy? Top, top corner here is play. It's not. It's not much closer than it was, right? Do you hear it much better? There you go. Nineteen thirty-four. Yeah, it looks right. Okay. Good. Okay. Well. Yeah. Just kill it for a second. Okay. Let me know when you're cool off, Indy. Yeah. Hang on a sec. Check one two. Yep. I always get nervous about stuff like that because it's so hard to coordinate. How many people are live right now? I, I don't know. Flo, how many people are online? 700. Oh, nice. Can you hand me that water? I didn't even wear the right pants. Sorry, people at home. It's it's very, there's a, yeah, no air conditioning here or anything in the studio. Yeah. Okay, it might have been better down there on the floor. I'll just put it there so you don't have to worry about the sound. I mean, our lamps are starting to cook, but we got air conditioning, so. When I checked into my hotel yesterday, the woman said, do you want a room with, with air conditioning or not? What kind of question is that? It's, it's like, you know, it's 35 degrees here. So I'm like, yes, I would like a room with air conditioning. <laughs> you know? I, I mean, yeah, I could have been sarcastic and ended up losing out, knowing me, uh, that totally happens. <laughs> All right, well, you ready to roll back up? Uh, I'm, I'm good. Are you, you good, Flo? So, well, everybody out there live stream is watching and enjoying. Right. Um, we'll get to questions about the, the handguns later and stuff, right? But uh, So I want to do a, a, be a beginning for, the, for rifle, American rifles. Yep, give me a second to cook up. Just tell me when you're ready, man. Yep. I sent them some photos this spring of me making chicken fried chicken finally in Stockholm. They didn't get any. That's good. That twist. Yeah. Recording. Yeah, uh, that's recording. Uh, unlike we're good. Okay. most of our live streams, we won't actually have much time to really answer any questions because one, it's boiling in here, and two, we're going to go over on time anyway. Um, oh, okay. Well, you can ask me stuff in the other thing. All right. You, well, I'm ready to go then if you are. Okay, I am. Okay, I'll do another intro so everybody can see how exciting my intros are live. Um, okay, ready, Phil? Do we want to clap or no? Okay, don't you clap. <laughs> can't take you anywhere. I'm Indy Nidell, and this is another Great War special. Uh, on different weapons, rifles, and handguns of the First World War. And as in all of our other weapons specials, we're here with Othias from C and Arsenal. Othias, could you please say hi to everyone in TV land? Hi to everyone, and I'm pretty sure TV is dead land. Well, that's kind of what I meant, but I wanted to give him the benefit of the doubt. Now, today, <laughs> we're going to be talking about American rifles of the First World War. Are we not? Yes, that is our plan, and we have a good little pile going. All right, well, if we've got a bunch of them, let's just jump right into it. Uh, what do we got first? All right, so I want to get something out of the way because for a number of years, we had people wanting me to cover what was the previous rifle. Remember, we did handguns and we talked about the Colt New Army. Yep. Uh, the previous rifle for the U.S. would have been the Krag Jorgensen from the Spanish-American War. And the failures of the Krag Jorgensen would lead to the later standard Springfield 1903 that we'll see in a moment. But a lot of people wanted me to talk about this gun because it was used in a training purpose in World War I. Uh, but then there was an argument about whether or not it ever made it to Europe. And it turns out some engineer units actually did take the Krag with a fixed amount of ammunition that was very hard for them to resupply. And later they would just be swapped to either uh, foreign weapons like the short magazine Lee Enfield or they would be given a Springfield eventually. Um, so some of these did actually make it over. Probably not frontline service, but hey, it counts, they got the punch mark in. And a lot of people like the Craig Jorgensen, so it's worth probably a mention. So let me get this on in where you can see it. 
Now this gun came out before people were completely obsessed with stripper clips and end blocks. Actually, I lie that we're still pretty much uh, available, but the US decided they wanted dump loading. So the idea is that you open up the side gate, throw your five rounds in loose, close it up, and it deposits them all the way on the other side of the action where they can then be picked up by this tray. And part of that is so that you have an easier time single loading one round if you wanted to fire without the use of the magazine. This used to be an old sort of standard of we don't want to burn through all the ammo. And with America being a frontier army, it kind of makes sense that they wouldn't want to just sort of shoot through their magazines. They'd want to just carefully load one at a time and make their shots count. Uh, anyway, so uh, turn down bolt handle, uh, basically a single locking lug. In theory, there are two, but the way these were fitted by the factory, you kind of lose that. There's too much of a margin now. And so the strength is fairly low. They can only handle the 30, 40 crag cartridge. They could not make the leap to say the later 30 out six that America would adopt. Um, so basically they just, they had a soft point where it was time to give up on this particular design after the Spanish-American War. Uh, here, let me get backed out. <coughs> so what happened was uh, the U.S. won that war very handily, but they noticed that in infantry fighting, their reload speeds, overall distance of their shots and accuracy were lower than the Spanish that they were fighting. And so, uh, rather smartly, even though they had won that conflict, they said, we need to look at the enemy's weapon and we need to get something a little bit better than this Craig Jorgensen. So they would adopt a variation of the Mauser in the Springfield 1903. So what this is, is this is an American version of the Mauser rifle. Now they started with the Spanish 1893, but then they must have observed some of the 1898s or some other designs because there's some other features that come in here that are not specifically from the Spanish Mauser. But uh, if we take a closer look, you can probably see that heritage. So again, just like the Mausers we've seen previously, we have a cocking shroud, a flag safety, the cocking piece at the rear, bolt handle back behind the receiver, closed bridge, and then two front locking lugs with a full extractor. This is a Mauser rifle. It's just been adapted by the US. Uh, it also has a unique magazine cutoff so that you can again, either single load or load for fire from the magazine. The US is still thinking of saving their shots. Uh, there was some argument over the rear sight. They ultimately went with a modification of the Buffington, which is a sort of delicate looking, finely adjustable sight. And then for all the sort of fighting that went into the site, after you get up past about, mm, I'm trying to think of the exact measurement, but I want to say it's past 1,400 yards or so, uh, this site is actually not calculated correctly. So long range shots were a little difficult until that was fixed later on. And then from there, full hand guard, you guys know what these sort of military rifles look like otherwise. Get up. No, I'm, I'm just looking at um, oh. Yeah, uh, cool. Um, why not? I was thinking you, you mentioned um, uh, them not using stripper clips and stuff. I guess I'll ask you once we go further in the guns because I thought that was interesting about when we would change to that or if we change to that since I don't. Yep. Know. So the Springfield does take on the stripper clip, which is a very good feature because you have to think about the math here. If you have a gun with no magazine, a single loader, all right, and you load one round and fire it, load one round and fire it, load one round and fire it, that gives you three rounds. Well, if it's a magazine gun, but has no rapid feed system, no rapid loading system rather, uh, so a tube magazine or like the crag with a dump load, uh, the time it takes you to load one round versus three is three times. So if I want to put in one round in the gun and then fire it, one round fire it versus putting all three in and then firing it three times and then putting all three in one by one and firing it three times. Basically, it come out almost the same. Yeah. Without rapid loading, without some sort of packet that takes all the ammo together, a single shot rifle versus one with a magazine, when you divide it over the course of a battle, both soldiers will roughly fire the same number of shots. The only advantage to the magazine is that when you need a burst of gunshots, like a cavalry breakthrough or a change in the line, you can then burst the magazine but you're back down to zero and you now have to take the time to either load that magazine all the way up or you're back to that one at a time firing rate. So right. a stripper clip is very important. And that's why the US and many other countries would ultimately move away from something even like a marginal benefit like dump loading the crag, only a tiny bit faster than single loading. Uh, stripper clips are the way to go and block clips are the way to go. And nowadays detachable magazines are the way to go. Yeah. Um, in the case of this gun, stripper clip, front locking lugs, very strong action, extremely powerful 30-06 cartridge. 
uh, one of the heavier hitters of the war. Uh, and ultimately, though, a fairly light rifle. So sometimes a bit aggressive for this combination, but most U.S. soldiers really love this gun. It's a universal short rifle, so it was very maneuverable. We did not adopt a full-length long rifle like we saw with Germany and France and things like that. So these were very handy in the trenches. This was a good fit for World War I in a bolt-action conflict. And, and this is where we started. So where did we go from here? Well, uh, the 1903 would not be produced in enough numbers to satisfy U.S. demand for the war. As a matter of fact, despite being the official gun of the U.S. in World War I, it was not the most common. There were actually millions of another design produced starting in 1917, and they outnumbered this gun basically two to one. So while almost, you know, most of the photos show photos of this gun because they were careful to sort of stay with that sort of American exceptionalism even when they were doing the photography, and this remained the official gun even after the war despite some debate, this was not the most common gun on the U.S. battlefield. The most common gun would actually be the 1917, which I have to dig just a bit to get out. Ooh. Now, we probably mentioned this briefly on the British episode because this is actually derived from the British Pattern 13, later Pattern 14 rifle. So before the war, the British wanted a very long range, very short, um, I'm sorry, very long range, very flat shooting, lighter cartridge, basically like a small diameter Magnum cartridge. Um, the idea is that they were coming off of the war in uh, Africa and they were worried about long open spaces and they basically want to create a very precise, very long range, very accurate rifle. Uh, in that case, they were going to adopt a small bore, high velocity bullet, and that didn't go so well because war broke out, so they had to take that same gun and produce it in 303 and have it produced in the US commercially. The reason for that is because to get the US to produce Lee Enfields would be very complicated. And it takes a number of years to sort of spool up and get used to how to produce a Lee Enfield because it's a fairly complicated gun to make. We talk about this in our Lee Enfield episode and in our Pattern 14 episodes. So the uh, UK has us producing Pattern 14s for them. And then when the US enters the war, well, they have the factories that were producing the Pattern 14s turn around and produce this, the 1917, which is the same gun without the volley sights and now chambered in 30-06. And because of losing the rim, there's actually enough room in the magazine that you can fit six shots instead of the standard five, although the stripper clip still only came in five round clips. Okay. So if we take a look, this is another Mauser-derived weapon. We see our caulking shroud, caulking piece, we see our front locking logs and long extractor, although in this case it's caulk on close, we compress the spring as we close the bolt versus compressing it as we open the bolt. It has a dog leg bolt that puts you down by the trigger. It's a very heavy gun with a very large heavy barrel, uh, very clear sights, and then most importantly on this at the rear, we have a rear aperture sight. So you look through a little peephole yeah, in order to see that front sight. That's the first thing I saw was the the site the site there. Sorry. Yeah, these same sites would be adapted ever so slightly to work on the Browning automatic rifle because these are some exceptional sites. Yeah. And what is it that's so exceptional about them? What makes them? Well, you said the other one was inaccurate over say fourteen hundred yards and stuff. Um, what about? Well, it's not. It, it's interesting. Inaccurate is the right word because the gun, the Springfield nineteen three, is precise far past fourteen hundred yards. But the problem is the sites were calculated incorrectly. So the gun. We also had this problem with the original uh, Browning 1917 machine gun, and so they had to replace those sights as well. And it was only figured out during the war. So it made for certain conflicts where you want to fire over the heads of your friendlies at the enemy. Well, you don't want to get those calculations wrong. That's how you take friendly fire. Right. So this one is set up properly. It's calculated correctly. Uh, these guns chamber the same 30-06 cartridge. They're much heavier and a little longer than the 1903. So troops didn't like them as much on first sight because they'd pick them up and this is just a brick by comparison. It's not nearly as mobile or light. However, they were preferred by marksmen because the British were obsessed with fixing their precision problems from the previous uh, short magazine Lee Enfields. Uh, there were, the Lee Enfields beautiful rifle and a lot of people argue with me, check out our episodes on what I'm talking about here, but those guns, you have to have a certain amount of knowledge and very careful manufacturer to get them to be accurate because they use thinner barrels, lighter materials. They didn't use a stepped barrel. They had a sort of buffer in them and everything like that. Don't worry about the details. The short answer is when you shoot a gun, it vibrates, it heats up. And if it's not, if the barrel's not bedded properly or the barrel's not heavy enough or the barrel's not this or that, you'll start to get some wandering depending on temperature or you know distance or whatever. This gun, however, the British really scientifically went at trying to make the most accurate gun they could get. And so 
even though it wasn't designed for the 30 six cartridge, it does a fantastic job. And these would re be retained even for sniping purposes through World War II. Like they are very good, accurate guns. Okay, oh, that's cool. Uh, it's, I, you know, I'm always fascinated when we see just the, the sometimes slow developments and sometimes a real, you know, an instant thing and stuff. You know, like uh, maybe not as dramatic a changes from like black powder. You know, but um, still, this is my think my favorite part of these. So, uh, and where are we going from here? Well, uh, I have to talk about another 1903, interestingly, but before I leave the 1917, I want to say one more thing. That rear aperture sight, you look through it, it's a little circle, you'll automatically center because people just want to center the front post. It made training a lot faster, it made it easier to uh, see what you were pointing at, and much faster sort of rapid fire, uh, or rather acquisition and fire. Uh, and then the, the aperture sight, like I said, would be applied to like the Browning automatic rifle. And then after the war, the U.S. would actually go back and consider making this the official U.S. weapon. The Springfield won out in that regard, but they still added a rear aperture sight to that gun because they liked that part of this design so much because the rear aperture is a really good idea. Uh, May from our series actually ranks this among her favorite rifles of the war, hands down, uh, in terms of just layout, good ergonomics, and rapid fire and accurate fire. Well, she certainly shot a lot of them, so yeah, I guess I, yeah, I would trust that. Yeah. She's got some strong opinions. Um, I just happen to have something. This is not a uh, widespread rifle, but a lot of people might find this curious. This is the Springfield 1903 Air Service. Now, these were extremely limited use. They were basically in trial in the air when the war ended. So maybe a half dozen were up in the planes being tried out. This was designed as a backup weapon for if the machine guns failed in the plane. Uh, this is actually a perfect example of miscommunication during the war. Uh, people always talk about this gun being invented in the war and that gun being invented in the war. And the truth is, it was much more of an evolutionary process. There were thousands of designs before the war, many of them underappreciated. And then during the war, some died off and some sort of bred. They were produced more because they were useful. Well, this is one of those weird chances where they had a chance to innovate and they kind of messed it up. So the American Expeditionary Force uh, flyboys say that they want a light, semi-automatic, but still somewhat hard-hitting uh, carbine for use in the planes in case the machine guns jam. Well, they're thinking Winchester, um, like 1907s, 1910s, with you know nice, heavy-hitting cartridges. But maybe you know they want a little hotter than that. Even though they're going, and 351's not doing it. 401 might, but eh. and we have a whole episode coming up on those guns, but. The U.S. government doesn't have a way to produce those, and they're already running out a bunch of these Springfields, and they say, well, let's just take what we're already making and adapt it for air use. And they basically miss the point. They put a you know 25 round magazine on this thing. They cut down the stock. They modify the sights to be a nice open buck horn. Those are all good things for trying to use out of an airplane, but it's still a bolt action, which was at the very core of the what the AEF was asking was like, can we get a semi-automatic rifle? And right. they just said, here's a bolt action. And so the plane guys were kind of like, uh, we're not into this thing. And then luckily the war ended before it got any more embarrassing than that. Yeah, because I can imagine how tricky that would, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But these are these are quite rare. Uh, most of them were turned back into regular rifles or disposed of because they were so unpopular. This just happens to be an original, which is pretty cool. Um, and that's just a little story of how um, a lot of people sort of expect all these secret weapons of war to be better. But a lot of times the sort of secret weapons of the unheard of weapons were much worse, and that's why we don't hear about them. Along the same vein, we've already done an episode on the Pedersen device, which was an attempt to take the Springfield 1903 and make it semi-automatic uh, with a pistol caliber cartridge. This was a secret weapon that was supposed to be released in the spring of 1919, but of course the war ended. And uh, I'm gonna tell you from what we did, we were lucky we did not issue those guns. That would have been a huge waste of resources and maybe even a waste of lives. They were not a very good design, but you can go check that out on our channel as well. And, and it's interesting, because I've always pronounced it Peterson, so it's Pedersen, right? As to my knowledge, it's Pedersen, but who knows? People were calling the uh, the U.S. World War II rifle the Garand, or sorry, the I'm getting backwards now. They would call it the Garand because it had been written that way. Uh, and then the man himself, in an article, wrote down phonetically how to pronounce his name. He said his name was Garand. So we've spent 50 years saying Garand, but yeah. he called it Garand. And I think, honestly, it doesn't matter. Once you know what you're talking about, it's a little pedantic to get worried about it. And that's interesting, the 25-round magazine there for a uh, rifle like that. W there were never any uh, any any uh, rifles by any of the uh, warring nations that were not for, like, air use like that that had, like, 10 or 15, did they? Have we, we haven't no, no, trench mags were actually common for a number of guns. Basically, if you were able to have a, a vertical magazine of some sort, so, like, the Germans would have their own, like, 20-rounder that they would attach to their gun. 
Uh, that magazine capacity is basically 20 plus the gun's own five, and that's how you get up to 25. Right. Um, the magazines for that gun were overproduced because the magazines were thought to be more useful than just the gun itself. So for a while there, you used to be able to buy those magazines you know, on the U.S. surplus market for like 20 bucks, although nowadays they're a couple hundred because people know what they are and they're getting scarcer as more people have played with them. But they made way more magazines than they did air service rifles. Um, hmm. Just because, hey, we could attach it to anything, it would be very helpful. Now, uh, in terms of long arms, we are out of rifles, but there's something else I want to mention. Uh, there were two combat shotguns and then a number of commercial shotguns with the U.S. in the war. Right. Uh, this happens to be the Remington Model 10. This is actually the rarer one, and yet it's the one I have on hand. Uh, I don't currently have a World War One Winchester 97. There are some slight differences by the time you get to World War II, and those tend to be much more plentiful. Um, following the war... I'll tell you about this in a second, but basically following the war, since the shotguns weren't really retained, a lot of attrition happened on the original Winchesters and Remingtons because they were sort of turned back into more commercial style shotguns because generally people didn't favor the handguard or bayonet lug for sporting purposes and a lot of them were surplus. So it can be hard to get these in original condition. But uh, so this is a trench shotgun. Uh, in this case, it has a bayonet lug that would take the same bayonet as that 1917 rifle because there were many more of those produced than the Springfield bayonets. And then it has a this one has a wood handguard. The Winchesters had a nice perforated steel metal handguard. And the whole idea here is that you can get a hold of the shotgun while it's warm so that you can still use the bayonet when it's attached even after firing. Okay. The problem with this, though, is that as much as there's a big sort of fan club for American shotguns in war... A lot of that comes from World War II experience in which the shotguns were fairly effective. In World War I, they were not. Now, uh, I've already done an episode on this, but in that time, I've worked with another researcher and we've managed to turn up documentation from the National Archives in the US. And the truth is the soldiers hated these trench shotguns. And I'm gonna get a lot of blowback on that, I know. Just hold out for my episode. I'm gonna have absolute proof of this in memos and other things that were written by the US Ordnance Department, sworn statements, things like that. But it all came down to the ammo because we were issuing 12 gauge paper shell cartridges in the muddy trenches of World War I. Not even waxed paper, paper shell. Later oh, they'd try wax cartridges, later they'd try brass jacket, like just pure brass uh, cased shotgun shells, which have their own problems. Um, but for the, for the most of the service life of the shotguns in World War I, you were lucky to get two shots out of it before it jammed up from the moisture and buildup in the magazine tube from having swollen paper cartridges in them. So they were only really used effectively for like night raids because then one shot's not a big deal and then from there eh, not so much preferred oh i just lost my camera all right i gotta give it just a cool down sorry andy oh that's okay um uh, yeah that's, that's it's it's interesting when you say that, that people just hated them flip it uh wait flo is pointing at me again yeah with a trend shotgun so uh, but he, we need to wait for his camera back though yeah sorry give me a second I mean, you can pre-tell me stuff, and then I can just be ready to okay, address well, it. Well, you know, of course, we, we've heard many times that the Germans protested the Americans' use of trench shotguns, saying yep. it was an unethical weapon of war. Can you talk a little bit about that when you get... I can. Uh, As a matter of fact, why don't you let me do a kind of a quick close-up on this, and then... Um, I don't know. We don't really need a close-up, do we? No, we're fine. Um, that might be an easy cutaway question because of what I was talking about in the camera cutout, so... Okay, are you back? Yeah, you're back. No, I'm not back yet. I mean, I'm giving them just a moment to cool, but I'm saying when we come back, if you want to just film okay. asking that question, because that's a way for me to sort of, it would be a way for you to chop up what I was saying and not lose it's the footage. It's a great way to chop it up, too, so people can look at me for a second. Me All right, now we can cook them back up. Tell me when you're going. Yeah, give me just a second. I miss my Ernie mug. I do. Where is it? Okay. Okay, yeah. we're recording again. Okay. Uh, Othaya, so we've, we've said a lot, and certainly in Out of the Trenches, and people have asked about it, that um, the Germans particularly complained about the American use of trench shotguns, saying that it was, uh, it was an immoral or unethical, whatever you want to call it, weapon to be used in the war. Uh, can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, that was often taken as a marker that these were incredibly effective. And I admit, I fell for that too. If you watch your episode on these, I kind of mentioned, hey, the Germans got real riled. They must have had a problem with them. But like I said, the U.S. side said, nope, these are not working very well. And the truth is the Germans probably suffered very few casualties to guns like these. But here's the thing. Germany had been in trouble in the media since the rape of Belgium. 
like they had all this pitted against them. And actually, there's a we're going to do a whole episode just on the Belgian comm lanes to explain how that whole situation kicked off with the Germans sort of reading one sort of people as civilian terrorists and the Belgians reading them as a military force. And that's what sort of kicked off that whole misunderstanding. And we've got a rifle that sort of represents that story. We'll get there eventually. Um, but Germany had bad press and they're launching gas and all these other things. So one of those things, one of the things you want to go with is, okay, you're the bad guy on the world stage. You will grab onto anything you can. You've already been told that you have serrated bayonets and gas and that you're killing civilians and all this other stuff. Well, the Germans would do two things that really stand out in small arms world. They would say that the US was using shotguns and then therefore that's a war crime. And they'd also point at Britain and say that Britain was intentionally making dum-dum bullets, uh, snub-nosed bullets in order to maim their own soldiers. Both of which are kind of ridiculous. Like there's German footage of uh, taking a bullet and shoving it into the magazine cut off of a Lee Enfield and snapping the tip off and being like, look, they designed their guns so that you can make dumb dumb ammo, which is just silly. And so is sort of the claim of the shotgun being an unnecessary weapon of war in the case of, uh, you know, conflict and trenches with gas and everything else. Uh, but it's just one of those things. It's political. It's just them sort of pushing back. It doesn't actually mean that these were all that effective, unfortunately. Now, again, they would do fine in World War II because they had better ammo. Really, it's not the gun. It's the ammunition. But unfortunately, with the ammo they had, they were very unpopular. And I kind of can't wait to get into that story because people really sort of assume the other way around. Well, how did they not see problems coming with paper paper cartridges? I, you know, having it wrapped in paper. How did they not think, oh, this might be a problem in a muddy, filthy, wintry war? You know? It's more than likely that they just bought up commercial ammo like they would do for any of this stuff when they needed to go. Like, you, you're thinking this is the first really widespread issue of a shotgun. The Winchester 97 was popular. As a matter of fact, I should put this down. I have a Winchester 97 commercial shotgun. A lot of these were sort of brought over to the Philippines in shortened configuration and used militarily there. And they did quite well because of their sort of limited use and not sustained exposure to trench fighting. Like, you keep it in your cabin or whatever in the Philippines. And yes, the cartridges could get a little soggy, but mostly you could store them well, load them, go out on patrol, use them, come back, store them again, whatever it takes. Right. What they don't figure on is they're going to spend days and days and days at the front in a trench in muddy, wet conditions. That's what really swelled up those cartridges while they're sitting in the magazine tube unattended. So you don't even necessarily know that there's a problem until you, until you start pumping this thing and nothing's coming out. So... I get the oversight and they tried to correct it, but realistically, shotguns represented a very small portion of the overall US loadout. So it's not like they wanted to put a ton of effort into them versus getting more of what they really needed. Okay. Well, that's good to know. But you you had a um what else? You had another shotgun you were gonna show us, right? Is this what you're gonna show us now? Yeah, I just pulled out this long Winchester 97. Right. Commercial shotguns like this one with the long barrel and everything, just literally sporting purposes, the kind that you go out for bird hunting. Uh, a lot of these were bought by the US and used at say prison camps or factory guards or things like that. You can see a lot of photos of American servicemen with big old shotgun shouldered from everything from like Winchester to Remington and things like that. Just whoever happened to have a long arm that they could sort of put on their shoulder and free up a proper gun for the front line. You'll see some of that as well. Okay. Uh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Um, do we have any more uh, rifles or shotguns today or is that it for this one? That's cleared it for now. There's obviously automatics and things that we don't have here because of, you know, laws and effort. But uh, for rifles and pistols, that's pretty much the spread. I like uh, we have episodes for effort. most of the U.S. long arms now. We're working on them for the pistols. So as you get a chance to come by the show, maybe subscribe and see it when it turns up. Uh, if you're wondering why they're not there yet, it's because we like to go nice and deep and get all the facts before we say anything. We don't want to assume that what's sort of the general zeitgeist is actually true. Uh, we're not going off of Wikipedia. We're going and looking at original sources whenever possible. That's 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 admirable, and we like to say that we do that too, and we do do that too. Wait, Flo, what? Can you ask him how, the, how good were the guns question again? What do you mean? Like, can you tell us how good these guns he just told about? Okay, uh, as, uh, as for the shotguns, if you could, forgetting about the uh, problems with the cartridges. Also the oh, and okay, Flo says, okay, well, how good were they? Compared Without to the bells and stuff like that, you yeah. know what I mean? Without the cartridge problem, the shotgun is actually very effective in trench combat. Like, it, it's not hard to imagine. Um, they would they only issued double-up buckshot. I get this a lot. People are like, 
well, they had birdshot for this and blah, blah, blah. And maybe a few cases would sneak in here and there. But the way the U.S. inventory system was set up, they only had buckshot. But when they could get birdshot, they could use it for sort of side hunting or shooting down carrier pigeons or things like that. Um, generally, they didn't have that ammo available, so it didn't happen as much as people like to think. But I'm sure some of it got up there or some people were careful with their buckshot or they just fired enough to hit the thing. We did some testing because there's an old myth that you could return a grenade with a shotgun. Um, so we actually went out there and got some uh, reproduction German stick grenades, threw them up over a hill and tried shooting them with buckshot, which actually took a lot of arrangement because buckshot is not really safe to fire into the air. So we had to make sure of our backdrop and everything. But um, the thing about buckshot is you got to imagine you're shooting however many pellets, you know, depending seven or five, or it gets into different sizes, but you're shooting pellets of what is essentially 32 ACP. So you get a big burst of 32 ACP sized pellets. Yeah. And so in that regard, it's kind of like mag, every shot is like a half mag dump of a pocket pistol. Um, and so when you do that in a trench, it's actually fairly effective. The problem is you just couldn't keep a reliable stream of those things coming because of the uh, cartridges. Okay. And what about the uh, what about the rifles? How how do they stack up effectively compared to some of the European counterparts that we've seen? On the world stage, the U.S. weapons were honestly, in this case, superior. And uh, I try not to toot that horn, but a, the Springfield 1903 is a very handy short rifle. Uh, it could have some minor improvements done to it, but realistically, it was as good or better than most of the stuff that was on the field at that time. There were no mechanical problems with it. Uh, we're not seeing any of these Ross rifle issues or anything like that. Um, it's very accurate. There's not, there's no problems with it. Uh, even with those sort of sight miscalibrations, nobody was really using those ranges anyway, because yeah. the, yeah. you know, trench warfare, mostly up close. Like we see a lot of guns shorten their length. We see smaller, like things tend to tighten up after world war one, because we realize we're not firing at multiple thousands of yards. Um, for this, uh, 1917 that was a clearly superior rifle it was kind of heavy you didn't really want to have to haul it everywhere you went but realistically it did everything that the ross rifle should have been able to do but couldn't so it was very accurate hard hitting uh easy to maintain beautiful sights <clears throat> uh, very adaptable to being scoped like these are the 1917 is just a beautiful platform overall with very good ergonomics so fantastic gun um britain had the p14 like i said they yeah. almost didn't shoot them at all they really kept them for home guard use because they weren't the standard lee enfield even though they were in many ways superior the u.s had no qualms about that the u.s sent them right up to the front line and used them heavily and found a lot of love for them so uh if you uh, uh, is there one of these that you've done a full special about that i can link to uh in uh in an outro in terms of the rifles, we have done all the rifles for the U.S. And then for the shotguns, we've done the Remington Model 10. So there are a plethora of U.S. long arms over on our channel now. Okay. Well, um, why don't hmm, – well, how should I do the outro? Because I, I want to link to something of yours. I would say send them straight over to that Pedersen device. That's probably the wackiest thing they'll see. And they're not going to see it anywhere else because I don't know of anybody that's actually sat down and tried to get a whole magazine out of that gun. And we only really talked about it like in like one out of the trenches other than mentioning a couple times. Okay. Well, I'm going to do – I'll do an outro here for that. Okay, everybody. Well, thank you, Othias, once again. That was fast. Fan <clears throat> okay, everybody, and thank you, Othias, once again. That was fascinating, and that was fantastic. Now, uh, if you would like to see uh, his episode about the Pedersen device, Peterson, Pedersen device, you can click right here for that. Now, Othias, you want to say goodbye to everybody? Yeah, uh, thank you guys for watching this special. And if you get curious about any of this stuff, come check out our channel. I, pl I promise it's apolitical. It's just a nice history lesson that's sort of wrapped around the development of a small arm. You can learn all sorts of extra stuff by studying one thing. And that is C and Arsenal. C ampersand Arsenal. Uh, okay, um, well, we will see you next time. Okay, okay. I'll just run a cool down. Flo says we have a break. We can talk about Southern cuisine, and then we go to the machine guns. Uh, let's see. <laughs> we look at it's like five thirty nine. I better tell that thing. I'm supposed to be somewhere at six. I'm going to tell him I'm going to be late. So I can try to hustle. Okay, but I'll just tell him it's a, like a ten minute walk from here. So I'll tell him like ten ten ten. And then I'm going to need to clear these handguns because I'm going to need a lot of room. Yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. Okay, I'm still...
Okay, let me do one thing real quick. Will you uh, reach up behind that monitor and grab me a double A? Because this is running low. Okay. That is sent. Uh, I like seeing how this all looks on camera. You never had a camera like this for me. Pardon? It is a bit ahistorical. A Okay, check one, two. You got me back. Oh, I did yeah, a battery change. Can you guys hear me? On Thursday, yep. In case you guys didn't know, we'll be in Belgium, and then we'll be uh, in London, and then at the Tank Museum in Bovington. If any of you guys are around and want to see us, you should uh, check that yeah. out. Flo, Flo, we'll post things in case you didn't hear about it. We're having a couple fan meetings and stuff like that. It's Can you guys fun. hear me? Yep. Hello? Can you hear me? I hear you, yeah. Oh, okay, good. I, may, I changed batteries on this unit. I oh. might be in Kansas City in the next month at the World War One Museum. I'm not sure. That it depends on my travel plans. I was there so, a couple years ago. It was it was fun. It was nice. Good. All right. So let me cook up again, and then we'll be ready to roll. And this is going to be machine gun. Uh, just to do an intro and say, like, uh, there are different kinds of machine guns. You know, the yeah. Heavy ones. Light ones, sure. Light ones. Sure. Recording. recording, recording. Okay, we're hot. That's still recording. Double check. Okay. okay, we're all good. Okay, uh, Flo is talking to me about the intro. So we're going to see a heavy machine gun, a light machine gun, a submachine gun. What are we going to see? It's four categories, uh, basically heavy, light, sub, and we'll talk about aviation, but I don't have one. Okay, well, I'll leave that into you. I'll just say we're going to see several different categories. Okay, I'll do an intro then if we're ready, yes? Yep. Okay, I shall clap again. I'm Indy Nidell, and this is another Great War weapon special. Now, today, we're going to be looking at machine guns. We're going to be looking at several different categories of machine guns, and I'm not going to be the one who's going to tell you about them. It's going to be Othias from CN Arsenal, who we do all of our weapon specials with, and, and his channel is awesome. So if you haven't been there, you should check it out yourself. You should subscribe, and you should watch it all. Uh, Othias, can you please say hello and tell everybody what we're going to be seeing today? Hi, uh, I'm still Othias, and this time we're actually talking about machine guns. It just so happened that the way we were doing some of our loaning and borrowing, we managed to get in just the right little ticket to sort of talk about these in a broad categorical sense. I can't exactly pile 30 machine guns into one room without having an ATF nightmare here. So uh, what I've done is I've tried to get something representative of what I would consider to be the general classes, in which case there will be four. So uh, after World War I, machine gun terminology sort of changes. You think of like heavy, medium, light, you think of special roles and all these other things. But realistically during the war, you only need about four categories. That is going to be sort of the heavy or emplaced machine guns, the kind that you would mount and have a crew to work. There'd be the light machine guns, which are one man operable and portable, so you could run up and attack with them much easier. Uh, and then third place, we see the emergence for the first time ever of the sub machine gun. And then fourth is actually just sort of the special stuff for aviation and tanks. These are lightened guns that are usually the first category. They're usually quote unquote heavy guns that are then mounted to a special vehicle and then lightened so they can get rid of their water jackets or otherwise modified to be better air cooled and we send them up in the air. Okay. So are we gonna move from heavy to light or light to heavy? Well, I think it'd probably be easiest to talk heavy to light because that tends to be how the history went. So uh, probably recognizable to most people out there if I can get it without snagging anything. Oh boy. Is this the German MG08? Yeah. Oh. Now, this guy is somewhere in the 40 pound territory without necessarily loading up on the water. That's gonna add some more weight. But this is a beautiful recoil and slightly gas assisted operated system. And this thing fires, well, it has a variable rate of fire, but you get the idea. It's a big honking machine gun. You mount it, you have a couple guys help you out with it, and then you just have a nice long peel at whatever front you're on. Yeah, it's not even that much to say. It pretty much says everything for itself. We've, of course, we've mentioned them many times in yep. regular shows, yeah. So this was invented by Hiram Maxim. Uh, it uses a sort of bendy bolt, like so you've got a toggle lock looking action in there that recoils a bit while it's locked, and then the joint bends and then that allows it to extract and load in their cartridge. We have a whole two episodes on this gun in its various forms already out for your enjoyment. But basically the idea here is it's a belt fed 
automatic crew serviced weapon that can be set into a position and used basically one of two ways, either with direct fire by sort of letting everything loose and just sort of moving it around like you're used to and pointing at, you know, whoever's coming over the line, or you can use it slightly more annoyingly than that as an indirect fire. So yeah. you can fire like light artillery up into the air and land your shots in an area where you know that there's enemy activity, creating what's called a beaten zone of eight millimeter lead cartridges fall or eight millimeter lead bullets falling on whoever happens to be in that region and generally annoying or killing them. So extremely effective and pretty much synonymous with the war at this point. I don't think of anybody really not recognizing the Maxim as the default machine gun of World War One because these were used on all sides. This one's a German MG08, but nearly identically you'll see it in every other army, except for maybe the British, they had uh, their own earlier Maxim design and then kind of skipped this generation and went for the Vickers, which is an inverted and shrunk Maxim. And then the French did their own thing because they're the French and they had basically, a lot of the French guns look like they're based off of locomotives. It's actually quite fascinating and I can't wait to get into the history of those on our channel. Oh, that would be cool to see. Yeah, you know, I know you don't have one of those with you today, but that, yeah, that'll be awesome. I, I think that, my, the French weapon specials actually might have been my favorite ones we've done so far because there was so much stuff, you know? Yeah, uh, they definitely have a different sort of evolutionary step for their roles. But so we have the Maxim. Um, this gun was extremely effective before the war for a number of people that were doing sort of colonial activities because when you were up against massed troops that were sort of inexperienced, you would think that somebody would take the time to sort of stop and take a one rifle shot at whoever was shooting this and knock it out of commission. But yeah. realistically, it's very hard to draw a bead on something that is just hucking hundreds of rounds a second at you. Yeah. So, uh, or not a second, but hundred rounds a minute or hundreds of rounds a minute at you. It really does keep the heads down. Um, and then in a lot of ways, Germany used this probably more effective than other country or more effectively than other countries. Um, Going into the war, a lot of people underestimated this weapon. The only real lessons for, you know, massed infantry machine gun use against modern armies came from the Russo-Japanese War just before World War One. Yeah. Um, Britain and other countries were used to using them in, say, Africa, where they were not, you know, not the most experienced opponents. So they got kind of lazy with their use of them. They had large mounts. Uh, they had less trained uh, crew on them. Whereas if you see Germany and it's weirdly Russia, they took them very seriously. Japan also took them seriously, but they were more mobile and not necessarily as bedded down. So you don't see a lot of Japanese machine gun use in World War I. Um, so Russia and Germany both go in with probably the most machine guns of any other countries. And then Russia, unfortunately, tells their troops that the gun is worth more than their lives. So they start holding the guns back. And so while Russia had more machine guns than anybody else available at that time, by almost double, uh, they did not get a lot of use out of them because they constantly kept them to the rear in order to self-preserve whoever was in charge of them. The oh. Germans got quite aggressive with these things and became very famous for sort of pushing the need for machine gun tactics in the Great War. That's interesting because that's something we hadn't covered was the, say, machine gun gap between Russia and Germany early in the war. I have to do a, a lecture at the University of Hertfordshire uh, next, next, is it? No, now on Sunday. Now on Sunday, that has to do with the Brusilov offensive, but I got to do a general intro to the Eastern Front before that. That's going to come in there somewhere, definitely. Thanks. Yeah, asking about the scope. Yep, but oh, he said, uh, "Wait, Flo's asking me what?" The scope for the MG8. Oh yeah, he wants to know. Um, can I ask you about this? Can I ask you about the scope for the MG08? So, what about the scope of the MG08? Uh, yeah, there's actually. Uh, as opposed to other nations, the Germans actually did have a standard uh, magnification for... Uh, I can't speak now. I broke my... Let me break my, my voice back out. Okay. Unlike other nations, the Germans actually did fit these with a standard scope. This one has lost its over the years, along with the mounting bracket for it, which is kind of in the way when you don't have the scope. We actually featured one over in our series so that you could get a better look at the device. But basically, that was used for being able to sight in a target at long range. And then, realistically, once you pull the trigger, you're not going to be looking through that thing. Because right. this guy likes to shake, even mounted on a very good German sled mount. Um, because of the nature of the action with that sort of toggling thing, you, you naturally throw mass away from the center line of the gun, so it's going to vibrate. There are other machine guns that try to get away from that, but this is the, going to have a little bit of shake no matter what you do. As a matter of fact, we could probably take a closer look so I can show you what I'm talking about. So if we get her propped just where you can see her, and I'm going to 
I have to play with this weight a bit, but I'll pop her open. And then this is our feed block. I can just lift that right out and you can see what's going on. So there's a big, and it's probably blurry for the live stream, but don't worry, the recorded one will do just fine. There's a big lock here. And if I pop this guy forward, which would be much easier to do if I wasn't on my side, unfortunately. This is gonna be my day. Give me a second, Indy. Yep. I'm just doing my No, she's just tied up for some reason. Give me a second. This is the beauty of working with machine guns is whenever you actually want to do something. Here, give me one second. Oh, see why she's tied herself up. There's no reason she's clear. Okay. I'm not sure what's got her snag. How long do you have this one for? Uh, just in another couple days. I held on to it for you guys and then I'm not really sure what's got her tied up at the moment. I just had her out yesterday. All right. All right. When in doubt. Sorry, Andy, give me one second. We pull that but you explained this then on your video on it, yeah? Yeah, we can just talk about it on my video, but more importantly, I'm wondering why. I haven't had it tie up once the entire time. Well, I shouldn't say that. I had it tie up one time because the thing was covered in rust when it came in, but... Um, yeah, I've had no problems until I get on air. There we go. All right. Yeah, okay, I got it. Cool. See, the good thing is they're very serviceable. I think she was out of position when she was stored. Yep, there we go. All right, so I'll just do that zoom in again. Oh, you're still zoomed. So. Oh, yeah. But, I mean, I'll just come in for it again. Okay. Okay, so, oh. okay, so you guys probably want to see how this works. So I'll just pop this lid open. We'll lift this feed block out of the way. That handles the belt. And then if I can get her lined up where you can see, yeah, I'm going to rack this forward. That brings our lock back. And then you see how it dropped down. Well, that's the heart of the whole operation. So I'm just going to pull that out. And there we go. So there's basically three positions in this gun. The top position is where the rounds are sitting in that feed block ready to be fed in. And then once we bring her back, it drops down, lines it up with a chamber, pops back up, we fire it. And then when she comes back again, she gets dropped down again, and she gets pushed out the ejection port. And that's really all there is to it. Give me my zoom out. We have animations over at the site or over at our channel. So you can see that without having to be completely confusing. But it's as simple as that to get in and out of this gun, which is very important because I can keep stripping pieces off this and I can have her down to nothing in just about a minute flat. If it were on its mount, even faster. Because right. this gun is designed in a modular way so that you can replace parts on it as they fail instead of having to take the whole gun off the front. All right. That's cool. Um, yep. Okay. So that's our heavy one. Are we looking at another heavy one? Or are we going to light? Or where are we going after this? No. So this is a heavy. Um, I'm giving you guys some images to work with. But basically, this would include things like the Hotchkiss 1914, the French 1907, the U.S. Browning 1917. Uh, the British got this a little lighter in the Vickers. So when we say heavy, it doesn't necessarily mean weight. We're really thinking about how it's in place. So right. like the Vickers gun in the U.S. is much lighter than this. But it's used the same way. We put it on a tripod. And we have multiple men crew it. And it's sustained fire, fixed position, very kind of hard to move. Um, it's not something that you necessarily attack with. You might use it to lead an attack by firing over friendlies to hit the enemy as they approach. Yeah. You're not really running and gunning with these sorts of guns. You are using them sort of thoughtfully ahead of time like light artillery. Right. Okay. These are also the guns that you think of, as I try to put it back now. These also tend to be the guns that you think of when you think of people defending a trench. So the enemy has come up over into no man's land and they're approaching uh, at full march or full run. And you, that, that image of just sort of gunning them down, that's yeah. the heavies because those are the ones that can handle that sustained fire. 
for as long as you can keep them fed, the parts don't break, and uh, the water is in the jacket. So you, or in the case of the French, they have some that are just so dense and heavy barrel that they can be air cooled. But the idea is that sustained multiple thousands of rounds of firing and the gun still runs. Light machine guns are gonna be another story. In this case, well, I have what may be more considered a medium, but it's still considered light for World War I standards. This is the Lewis gun. Yep. Now, uh, this was designed in the US, but the US did not take advantage of it. Instead, Britain would be the first to really go, oh, oh, we need that. Uh, it was designed around being air cooled. So that's why it has this big crazy jacket with all this serration cut into it. That's to give it more surface area. And then it has an aluminum fin set inside and the jacket goes out just past the muzzle. Let's see if you can see that a little bit, but it goes just past the muzzle so that as you fire, it creates a vacuum that then sucks air through this jacket and therefore cools the gun. Mm -hmm. Even so, you can't really sustain a thousand rounds of fire with this thing. You, you wanna keep it in bursts, you wanna keep it in the hundreds and then give it some time to cool off. I, I, I noticed that when we, uh, at one point when we had our new intro, we had a Lewis gun there that, uh, that didn't, have, didn't, have, didn't have the ammunition, did it? Right, no magazine. So these used a pan magazine. Oh. And these came in either single, well, this is a double stack, uh, and then there was like a quadruple stack for aircraft. So you could crank up, I wanna say it's like 47 rounds and then 97, I'm um, going off of memory there. And then it all feeds down into uh, here. As a matter of fact, let me get over to the zoom. I'll let you guys see. Oh. So you would have your pan mag. This would be loaded up with ammunition, feeds down into this little guy right here that's got a one-way spring, which trips down in the front. And then the bolt fires from the open bolt. So they get shoved down into this path. They sit up in there. And then when you fire, the bolt is going to, I'm gonna let this go more carefully than just a lot of the bolts gonna fall, bang. And then it's gonna recoil back and stay locked open. Right. Staying locked open as the default position allows it to stay cooler. And then the top works a lot like an old revolver in some ways. You've got little, <laughs> I just lost my camera right on that. Yeah. Here, hold on. I'll take it to life. Okay. I'll, I'll just take it to main. Give me a second. You've got little feet. Oh yeah, take me to main. I'm sorry. You got little feeder fingers that basically push this guy around in a big circle, and that's just how it strips off all the rounds. All right. Give me a second to go cool, because then Indy can say the next thing, and we don't have a mess on our hands. Okay. Tell me one. Um, I'm not sure why my close-up camera is going down a lot faster than my far away. Okay. I'm just going to give it two minutes. All right. But you want to think of anything that you want to say before? Because I'm going to need you to do the next lead. Yeah, in. sure. Um, I was going to, I was going to, I was going to, would this be something that you would most often use solo or would you have two people? Would you have more of a crew, even though it is portable? Okay. I'll have you give me that question in a second because that's an easy one. Oh, hang on. I do. Hang on. I'll be back sitting in just a moment. You're fine. You're going? What? Am I going? No. All right. Are you up? Okay, I can be. All right, just tell me when. I'm just going to run them up. That's weird. Okay, recording again. Okay. All right, you're up, Anif. Now, would this be something that you would um, most often use on your own, or would it still be a two-person, like an, a little crew that would use it even though it's portable? Um, uh, it, de it depends on the Army and the light machine gun, but generally, light machine guns... Oh, I'm making a big noise. Light machine guns were generally issued to two men, so you'd have somebody who is handling the loading and one running the gun. That's the general rule for most armies. There could be some differences. The other thing is with the Lewis gun, especially with the British, they had a habit of giving these over to groups of one, like one or two Lewis gunners, and then they'd have a big old handful of guys hucking grenades. So the idea was that you could take something like this and provide immediate suppressive fire on say a pillbox or other emplaced heavy machine gun. And then once you kind of had their heads down, the other guys could pull pins and send them up into that nest, and that's how you would clear a, a, a particular machine gun emplacement. Um, so these became very good at being used on the attack instead of just on the defense. Right. 
Now, uh, now let's say you were a crew of two and one of you's firing, one of you's in charge of the magazines and stuff. How many spares would that person carry? Would they have 10 or 20 or 30? I mean, yep. you know. it depends on the gun and the offensive, unfortunately, but you basically take as many as you can get. In terms of these pans, uh, we show what it's like to load one pan on our show. Uh, you don't want to load these in a fight. You would have them all preloaded and racked in a bag as many as you could carry. The gunner would also be carrying some too. So they tried to get, you know, a thousand plus rounds onto the two guys if they could, because the more that they can get up front. Now that depends though, because if you're going a short distance for a lighter attack, maybe you don't want to load down your men, but what if you're going a distance and you need to take the trench? And then this is the thing a lot of people forget is once you take the trench, uh, even if you succeeded, you blow out the full boxes, you take everything you land in there, there's going to be a counter attack. And so light machine guns become very important in that regard. And also the preparedness to have more ammo on hand, because once you take that trench, you have to immediately defend it. And so you don't have time to place those heavy machine guns. And so you have a defensive disadvantage from before. You know, you're not as good as you would be if it was in a, a trench that you'd had for an entire day and had time to get set up. So being able to take these light machine guns and find spots to quickly place them and quickly defend against counterattacks would be pretty imperative for trying to move the, tr the front line up and actually keep it moved. Okay, and it's nice. These both of these are. It's nice to see that you have these because these are both pretty iconic, and we've talked about them so often on the show. Okay, so where are we going to next? So next, I will try to get this guy put away. Next, we have what was new for once in the war. This is a submachine gun. This is the MP18I. And the eye is a bit of a mystery, although I have some theories about it being applied to the rear sight. But this is a simple blowback 9mm Parabellum uh, submachine gun. So light, handy, easy to use. Matter of fact, let me get you a quick close-up so you can see what's going on. Okay. So it's literally just fires from the open bolt. This is the safe position from here. If I pull that trigger, and this thing is deactivated at the moment, this is going through a restoration process, so I can do this safely. And that's it. So it would slam, it would immediately fire the cartridge when it closed and immediately get blown all the way back. And if I were holding the trigger, it would just keep cycling. Now this does use the same magazine as the German Luger, actually LP08, the artillery Luger, uh, it uses the same 32 round magazine as that gun with a sleeve to help it sort of set a little bit better because it's not as deep of a well as the Luger. And so this guy just wraps around and you would use a loader to load this up with 32 rounds and then lock her in and she's ready to go. You would carry six or more of these when you were on your assault, if you were a German, and they just plug straight in with a nice push of the button. So wow. click and then release is right there. Nice, big, obvious, easy to use piece of equipment. And then give me money. Now, when when did these enter service and, and who, were, who was using these? And when did they, uh, when did they start really making their appearance? These became available in 1918, and there's some argument between this and the Beretta 1918 as being the first true submachine gun. Before this, there was something known as the Villa Perosa, which is a two-barrel submachine gun that used a little mount. So it was like an ultra-light machine gun. It had a little bipod, had twin barrels, an excessively high fire rate to the point that it was almost useless. And so that is the first sort of pistol caliber automatic that people think of in a battlefield, but you could not shoulder it. And so this is sort of the... the this is a hard definition for people is whether or not the Villa Perosa counts as a submachine gun because we tend to think of them as something that you shoulder and therefore use from just walk and fire. Well, this and the Beretta would be the first two one way or another. Um, the Germans would get this one out in 1918 and it's unlikely that very many saw any sort of trench fighting, unfortunately, for the Germans because they just came a little too late. They would have been extremely effective if used earlier. They were very good for shock troops, extremely good at clearing a trench line. Yeah. Um, not so much in no man's land, very hard to use a pistol caliber out that far. But once you close the gap, I'm going to tell you, you'd have a hard time defending against something like this at close quarters. Wow, well, that's interesting. Another one of those, you know, what ifs, what happened, what might have been and stuff. Um, I'm going to have to head off fairly soon. So should we go to the, um, th was there more about this you wanted to go to or do you want to go? I can to just give, I can do a quick throwaway for you. Okay. So just uh, um, give me one second here. 
Yep, so submachine gun technology is still very, very new at the beginning of the war. We're going to have a whole episode on this gun. This is actually being repaired by us right now so that it can be put into use. By the way, if anybody's curious, all these guns are correctly and legally registered in the U.S., and they have gone through the proper channels to get to us. Uh, all the licensing is in place. I just get a lot of comments about people worrying that we're doing something illegal. We are not. It's all covered. Um, we're being very careful. Now, uh, the other class of guns that we haven't really got in studio to show you would be basically the first or second class, the heavy or light machine guns, modified for air service use. So it'd be something like an MG-08 with a bunch of holes drilled in it to mount to an airplane, or you'd have like the Lewis guns where most of these US made Lewis guns for the US were actually used for aircraft, not for ground forces. And so you would strip all the uh, extra cooling parts because you're an airplane, wind's blowing by you, you don't need to really have a water jacket, you don't need to have a big aluminum shroud, you just let the wind speed cool the gun and you fire it from there. The problems become that you need to interrupt your gears or some other method to prevent from shooting through your own propellers. Right. Uh, there's a whole history there that we're gonna hopefully talk about when we get into the MG815. And then um, you also want to think about Oh, I lost my train of thought here. Uh, oh, ammunition. You want to be able to control your ammunition feed because it's not always easy to load a belt or something while you're flying a plane at the same time. And you need ways to be able to sort of clear jams or have a backup gun. And I lost my main camera. Um, oh, okay, because I had a question for you. Okay. Give me one second. Kill it. I'll wait till your main camera. Sorry, give me 30 seconds. I'll just let this cool and I'll run it back up. You'll have the audio and I'll have some overlay images for you so you won't be dependent on that video. Oh, well, um, plenty to, I'm, sure the, I'm sure our fantastic editing squad who's sitting here sweating here. Uh, all right, well, say, say, say your bit and I'll run my camera up right before I do it. Okay, well, my question, uh, question was, um, if you read like, you know, Snoopy and the Red Baron, you know, Snoopy's, here's the World War I flying ace in his sop with camel and he's hunting the Red Baron, right? You know? Okay. And he always, he said, here's the World War I flying, now he always come, Twin Vickers was what Twin Vickers machine guns was what Snoopy used to use. What kind of Vickers machine guns would Snoopy have had, and how would they have been modified? Go ahead, kick that back on. Go ahead. I see you there. Yep. Okay. Got it. So, well, he would have had Twin Vickers. Um, I mean, Vickers were very common for the British forces at the very least. Although the Lewis gun was also pretty common in the air. Uh, but he would have had Vickers. The one thing that they would have done is they would have taken the otherwise water-filled jacket and either stripped it off entirely or left it there but hollowed it out and punched ribs in it to allow airflow over the barrel. And that's it. That's all you really have to do for an aircraft machine gun is just ditch the cooling mechanisms. Because the air is going to cool it and the water would just add weight that you don't need. And, uh, you know, okay. Right. That's all you need. No, that's interesting. I, 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 I always remember that from when I was a kid. What kind of gun Snoopy used? You never said anything about what the Red Baron was using. Well, uh, actually, there are photos of what are supposed to be the downed Red Baron's airplane, and there are two uh, LMG 0815s that are pictured as being his Ford-mounted guns. So if those pictures are accurate, I'll give you a copy of them for the show. Um, then that should pretty much decide it. Now, that depends on if it's actually his plane or not. I'm not sure if that was ever confirmed. I didn't look that deeply into them yet. I wonder if we, what, I mean, maybe we could find out by maybe Lothar, you know, his brother, who was also an ace, maybe you can find out what he used and he might have written somewhere in a diary or something what 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 Manfred was using. Um, that'd be an interesting challenge to try and figure out. We should put Marcus on that, Flo. Okay, we're going to put Marcus on that, all right? Well, I'll send you over the references I have for it because it's, it's if that photo set's correct, it's LMG 0815s because they're just sitting there playing his day. Okay. Um, now... For this uh, machine gun episode, is there? Do you, do you want us to link to? You, did you said you did an episode? You did two about the MG08, right? Yeah, that's probably a good one. Is the Maxim? Yeah, I, I, uh, yeah, I, yeah. Well, what, what would you like me to? What would you? Where would you like me to? Do? Lewis Maxim. Well, why don't you just pose the question to me about where should people start if they want to learn about these? Okay, now if people want to learn more about the machine guns, and you've done episodes about a bunch of these things, and and more that you haven't discussed today, where is a good spot for them to start? We have an episode on the Maxim, and actually, technically, the episode is episode 80 on the MG08 and the 81 on the Maxim 1910 that tells the whole story of that big Maxim gun. And it's also sort of the first successful military machine gun. So that gives you a good starting point. And from there, you can explore through any of the other stuff we've covered. We've done the Lewis gun. We've done the Browning automatic rifle. And we're already in the process of working with the Hotchkiss and some others. So there may be more videos by the time this gets edited. 
Okay, well, Othias, once again, thank you very much for joining us. This was fascinating as always. Um, say goodbye to everybody. All right, thank you all for tuning in and come check us out. Yeah, and if you want to see, if well, well, here, I'll tell you what, I'm going to point, and here comes the link. Here's where you can see the MG08 episode right there on his channel, and you can check out a bunch of his other stuff from there. And as for us, we'll see you Thursdays for our regular episodes and Mondays for other specials and Saturdays for things like Out of the Trenches and on Facebook and on Twitter and on Reddit and maybe on the street. And we will not pretend we don't know you. We'll stop and talk to you about the war because that's what we do. See you next time. All right. All right How's that? You can kill that camera.